A new study finds that some earthquakes on the San Andreas Fault in California are triggered by the sun and moon gravitational pull. Well, the video just before this one, tides trigger earthquakes. Even the slightest stress can cause tremor. We find that the low tide causes less pressure over the mid-ocean ridges that have magma chambers underneath. And that means that the magma chamber can inflate, come up, and that causes tremors at low tide. Now, some earthquakes on San Andreas triggered by gravitational tug, tug of sun and moon. We're talking here about planetary bodies. This is on FIS.org by Rosanna Xia, Los Angeles Times. Gravitational pulls between the sun and moon is not just high and low tides. It can also trigger a special kind of earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. The phenomenon fascinates scientists for years. Like sea levels, the surface of the Earth also goes up and down with the tides. It's not just the water that creates tides, it's also the Earth tides. So the surface of the Earth also changes rising and lowering with the tides and flexing the crust, stressing the fault inside. So new studies found that during certain phases of the tidal cycle, small tremors deep underground, they're known as low frequency earthquakes, were more likely to occur. Quote, it's kind of crazy, right? That the moon, when it's pulling in the same direction as the fault is slipping, causes the fault to slip more and faster. This is what Nicholas van der Elst explained. He's U.S. Geological Survey geophysicist. He's the lead author of a new study on this subject published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. He says what it shows is that the fault, San Andreas we're talking about, that's the longest, biggest uh, fault in California, what it shows is that this fault is super weak, much weaker than we would expect, given that there's 20 miles of rock sitting on top of this fault. The study shows how low-frequency earthquakes respond to the tides, can reveal new information about San Andreas, and what that may mean for larger quakes, researchers say. The information offers windows into deeper parts of the fault, as much as 20 miles underground, and that would otherwise be inaccessible. Scientists discovered these deeper tremors on the fault about 10 years ago along a particularly sensitive section in Parkfield, California. That's where the San Andreas transitions from its northern section, where it's gently releasing tectonic energy to the southern portion, which is locked and capable of producing a big one earthquake. And this is what, after the Ridgecrest earthquakes, Dr. Lucy Jones of Caltech warned us of that the Ridgecrest earthquake in no way lessens the uh, energy release of the southern portion of uh, the San Andreas Fault, which uh, is expected to produce a big one, mega thrust earthquake. So for his recent study, van der Elst and his team studied about 81,000 low frequency earthquakes from the period 2008 to 2015 on the Parkfield section of the fault, and they compared it to the two-week tidal cycle known as the fortnightly tide. And they found these earthquakes were more likely to occur during the waxing period when the tide was getting bigger and faster. Now, the, like, like the ocean tides, the strongest earth tides, we're talking about the earth moving, yes, even a couple of centimeters, earth tides occur when the sun and moon are also aligned. So we're having an alignment uh, today, as a matter of fact, in the area of uh, Mediterranean over Bethlehem, over Israel, over Greece, over Mediterranean, um, tomorrow, uh, towards tomorrow morning. So the moon will be uh, creating, uh, will be positioned in front of the sun, creating a total solar eclipse. So they're aligned. That means that we also had a, a total solar eclipse on July 2nd, we had the uh, over um, the uh, west coast, off the west coast of the U.S., July 2nd, remember the total solar eclipse, 
eclipse. And we said, oh, wait for an earthquake, because we saw that again in the big quake that we had in Greece in 1999. It was a couple of days after the, uh, the big earthquake happened in um, Turkey, a couple of days after, exactly two days after um, the total eclipse of the sun, August 15. They had their quake August 17. And uh, we had uh, uh, the Anatolia Fault came and uh, the pressure struck Athens, Greece in on September 7th. That's where we have the shanty town. People are still living there. They lost their homes. Uh, that's what I referred to at the end of every video. And um, so we're having one again tomorrow, a total eclipse of the sun. So where, wherever you have that total eclipse in that area is where you usually have an earthquake a little while later. So we saw that in July, July 2nd, we had the total solar eclipse. And we had on July 3rd, we had the 6.2 magnitude Cascadia earthquake north of Vancouver Island, just like we had yesterday, a 6 uh, magnitude of, uh, north of uh, Vancouver Island, Cascadia earthquake. And uh, then we had the, that, that quake caused the pressure to, relieve, to be re released at Ridgecrest, which is the southern portion of the Walker Lane Fault System, which is not one fault, it's a series of faults. Now, San Andreas was locked with garlic fault, so the quake uh, released and hit at Ridgecrest. And that happened before as well, when a 6.2 earthquake hit North Vancouver Island in 2015, 24 hours later, they had a 3.5 magnitude in Ridgecrest. Whereas this year, the 6.2 magnitude of North Vancouver Island on July 3rd only took 13 hours to hit on July 4th, the 6.4 earthquake, which was the foreshock to the 7.1. So that again was planetary alignment. It was a, a, a total solar eclipse, the moon uh, aligned with the sun. So when, when geologists come out and say, oh yeah, uh, total solar eclipses have nothing to do with the earthquakes, well, they're wrong. Because look at this. This is what we're talking about here now. And we're having one tomorrow, a couple, in a couple of hours, on Christmas Day, in the morning. So they found that these earthquakes um, were most likely to occur during the waxing period with the tides getting bigger, and uh, the strongest earth tides occur with the sun and moon are aligned, and the weakest occur when they are 90 degrees apart. So when they're sort of... Um, uh, quadra quadrant to each other. The same gravitational forces stretch and compress the Earth's crust, though the rock moves less dramatically than the seawater, as we can understand. Seawater is more liquid, so that's why it uh, moves a lot faster and easier. Now, some faults are more susceptible to tidal triggering than others, such as offshore faults like the Cascadia subduction zone off the Pacific Northwest coast. Other characteristics of the fault For example, like the Cascadia subduction zone off the Pacific Northwest coast, where we had, we had the six, six magnitude quake yesterday, uh, scientists said the uh, fault, such as the orientation or how close it is to the Earth's crust, also affects the tidal response. So it's very uh, astonishing that the San Andreas even produces small earthquakes after tidal forces have an effect on the fault. Researchers said, given that the fault is not oriented in any way that gets the full strength of the tides, so low-frequency earthquakes, they're called low-frequency for the rumbling sound that they make, and not for the rate of occurrence. And they tend to have magnitudes less than 1, and they occur to about 15 to 30 kilometers, 9 to 19 miles below the ground, nearing the deepest part of the crust where it transitions to the Earth's mantle. The it's significant uh, here is less earthquakes themselves. More important, they're given scientists about the deeper parts of the fault. USGS seismologist David Shelley helped write the, uh, the study, said they tell us that the fault continues down below where the regular or typical earthquake stop on the San Andreas, about six to seven miles down. And they tell us a lot of things about that deep part of the fault that before we had no idea existed at all. They also show that this part of San Andreas is creeping or slowly moving almost all the time. 
these low frequency earthquakes with the help of tidal forces essentially created a natural laboratory for scientists to keep uh, tabs on the false movement. Shelley said, it's almost like having a lot of little creep meters embedded in the fault. We can use those low frequency earthquakes as measurements of at least in relative sense, how much slip is happening at each little spot on the deep part of the fault where we see these events. When we don't see them, we don't know what's happening. We don't know whether it's slipping silently or not slipping at all. And he adds, the information is very useful whenever the deep part of the fault slips, the stress gets transformed into the shallow part of the fault. So of course, it comes up to the shallow area. He says, so if all of a sudden we saw that the deep part of the fault was slipping a huge amount, that might be an indication that there was an increased chance of having an earthquake come at the shallow part of the fault. So by looking at how the rate of activity varied over a two-week tidal cycle, Van der Elst and Shelley found most recent studies that the fault produced more low-frequency earthquakes if the tidal stress was larger than it was the day before. It's like the fault has an earthquake budget, Van der Ellis explained. If you used them up yesterday, you don't have as many to trigger today. But actually measuring that, we get an estimate of what that stress budget is. Now scientists have uh, now have a way to measure the fault's recharging time in certain locations. Scientifically, it's really cool because we don't have any other way to directly estimate that number, the rate at which stress is accumulating on the fault, Van der Ellis said. This is another study that's adding to our knowledge of how faults work in this transition. He added also, we don't quite know yet what it's going, it's going to mean in the long term, whether it'll result in some sort of warning that an earthquake is coming. So we're going to have to monitor it for a little bit longer. So this is fascinating, don't you think? Yes, the sun and the moon, of course, and the low-frequency earthquakes coming up towards the surface. Now, as far as tomorrow's eclipse, total eclipse of the sun over the Mediterranean, over Israel and uh, Cyprus and Turkey, and my God forbid, uh, I hope we don't have an earthquake, but we usually do. And so we'll keep a lookout to see what that is going to result, what that's going to give us. In the meantime, I wish you all a wonderful, blessed, joyous, loving, memorable, everything, the best of everything, Christmas season, Hanukkah season. God bless you all, you and your loved ones. Thank you for your support. Please share and subscribe and please comment. Thank you. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece. In Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.